Yes, social media is a environment that I think has a lot of that. You know, it's really interesting as I can reflect on it. I keep my distance from it right now. What's going on everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts. My name is Spidey and I use my degree in sociology and psychology, my certifications in criminal interrogation and body language analysis, and over 10 years experience as an award-winning mentalist to teach people behavioral analysis and practical psychology on stages and television shows all over the world. During the recent South by Southwest Festival, in a panel discussing inequality of women in media and entertainment, Meghan Markle spoke up about the toxicity and the bullying that she's experienced online. But what do her body language, facial expressions, and word choice reveal, and what is the hidden message behind what she's saying overtly. This one's gonna be a really wild one because there are a couple of key moments that are really interesting to look at, not just behaviorally, but also considering Megan's background as an actress and how that comes into play on a stage like this. Before we jump into the analysis, I wanna say I'll leave a link in the description to the whole panel discussion, and I encourage you guys to go watch it. There's a lot of thought-provoking stuff being brought up, and a lot of these clips that we're using for the analysis will have more meaning within the context of the discussion. I also wanna say if you're new to this channel, I hope you enjoy it, but if you're looking for content that will viciously attack Meghan Markle and look at everything she does through the lens that she's a horrible monster, you won't find it here. Similarly, if you're looking for content that just praises Meghan Markle and looks at everything she does through the lens that she's this saint that has no faults, you won't find that here either. This channel is all about nonverbal communication and behavioral analysis, and I try to look at behavior to see what they suggest about what the person is thinking and feeling. That's my only interest. My goal is never to attack or defend anyone, and if it comes off that way, I apologize. That's not my intention at all. That being said, let's dive right in. All agree that representation matters in terms of if you're a young girl and you see yourself in a position of power or strength or leadership, you can believe that that is possible. If you look out on the screen or you look out in the world and you see no one that looks like you, it is incomprehensible for most people to imagine that they can have that level of success or joy or strength, whatever it may be. And you know, the key thing that I think needs to be focused on in terms of equity is that it's not a zero-sum game. Just because someone else has the same advantage that you do doesn't mean that you're losing anything. And it actually creates an environment that is so fair, but also inclusive where people feel as though they have a seat at the table as they should. Okay, so here she is talking about the importance of little girls seeing women who look like them in positions of power and strength. And as much as it's a positive message, and I agree, this is a great opportunity to look at her behaviors and notice some differences between this and other times that we've seen her in the media and why we might be seeing these differences. So one thing that stands out is very often we're seeing sudden eye flutters. And this is where the eyes blink very quickly in succession. Now it's not happening constantly as she's talking throughout this whole thing, but there are certain topics or moments where we start to see these spikes with these flutters. Now the research shows us that when we see eye fluttering, it's typically one of two things. One is stress. Stress causes us to blink more. But the second reason flutters happen is processing. So when we're encoding something into our memory or retrieving something from our memory, we see these rapid blinks. Now keep in mind, we are talking about sudden eye flutters. There are people out there who just flutter a lot naturally, maybe because they have contact lenses and it's drying out, maybe because they're outside and the sun's hitting their eye. We're talking about when it starts to happen randomly. So in the case of Meghan Markle in this panel discussion, I think one of the reasons we might be seeing fluttering a little bit more often is because quite often when she's making public appearances, she has some form of creative control or someone on her team has some form of creative control on the final result. Whether it's the Netflix documentary or interviews she does in the media, where there are certain contracts in place, this is live, it's unedited, and it's airing as is. So she's aware that she has a lot of supporters out there, but she also has a lot of critics. So she has to measure what she's saying a little bit more carefully because she's aware of the fact that editing certain things out isn't an option. Another place where we see these flutters with her a lot, combined with other behaviors that make a lot of sense, is something we very often see in public speakers. And it's every now and then she's building a point and she gets the ball rolling and she builds momentum and she comes to life and she talks about it and talks about it. And then as she reaches the end of that topic, she has to figure out, okay, what am I gonna bridge to? What am I gonna say next? So we see this flutter as she's processing, okay, what am I gonna talk about next? 
and then she finds it and now she starts going again. And there was a really great example of that right here. So as she's wrapping up her point about how it's hard to imagine that level of success or strength if you don't see that representation, right at the end of that, we see that flutter starting to happen as she looks up, she readjusts in her seat, and now she looks down right after this flutter, and we hear her speech kind of falling apart a little bit. Her tone drops, and we hear, you know, the key thing that needs to be focused on in terms of equity. So she's hesitating a little. We have this, you know, we have this pause. We have these filler words, the key thing that needs to be focused on. And these are just filler words to get her to her next thought. And then the moment she says, it's not a zero sum game. We hear that confidence come back up and then she continues down that path with momentum or strength, whatever it may be. And, you know, the key thing that I think needs to be focused on in terms of equity is that it's not a zero sum game. Just because someone else has the same advantage that you do doesn't mean that you're losing anything. Now, this whole zero sum game statement is a script for her. It's something that when she's talked about this topic before, she's used that expression and she knows where to go with that topic. So she's just trying to figure out how to bridge from that one thought to the next thought. And that's why we're seeing all these things because big silences are awkward on stage. So we have this filler and then we go to the next thing. And here we go, now we know what we're talking about. So it's interesting to see what happens to her confidence in those moments where she's searching for what to say next and what that could tell us about some topics that are coming up. Megan, will you tell the story about when you wrote that letter to P&G? Because I don't know if anyone is, if everyone's heard it, but it's such a great story at a very young age, what you did. That's so funny. Um, yes, I, I just was... disrupted the flow. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, it's but good. Go we ahead. have a conversation. <laughs> That's what you know, I love um... about, about, about interviewing Katie. I think it's okay. <laughs> Um, I was uh, 11 years old, about 11 years old, and I had seen a commercial on TV um, for a dishwashing liquid, and the boys in my class at the time said, you know, it said, women all over America are fighting greasy pots and pans. And the boys said, yeah, that's where women belong, in the kitchen. And at 11, I just found that infuriating and wrote lots of letters and put pen to paper, and they ended up changing the commercial. Um, to people all over America. At some point, Katie Couric interjects here and asks Megan to tell the story of the letter she wrote when she was young. And this was such a reporter moment. This was decades of experience as a news reporter just pouring out with Katie Couric because she knows this story and she knows how it relates to this point and she knows that it'll connect with the audience. And if you notice her energy, it's not turned towards Megan. It's not her own curiosity. Like, Megan, tell me that story. It's to this audience. Her energy is towards the audience. She's saying, tell this audience that story. She knows her audience. And I don't just mean the people in the seats, I mean Megan as well. She knows Megan is proud of this story. She knows that Megan likes to tell this story. It paints her in a good light. So by giving her this opportunity, she's creating rapport with this person she's on stage with, and she's directing the story to the audience because she knows it'll connect well in both directions. As she's telling that story, she talks about the boys in her class and how they said, yeah, that's where girls belong, in the kitchen. And we see a couple of things. First, we see an eye block. This is when we close the eyes for longer than a blink would normally take. And we also see her posture shifting upwards as we hear a sharp inhale. And if we look at her left hand, we see it going back and forth, rubbing the top of her leg. So eye blocking is something we see when we're trying to keep a thought in or a thought out. Think of your eyes as the garage door to your mind. So sometimes when we're trying to hold on to a thought or focus on something, we close the eyes. Or sometimes when we're faced with an idea that we don't want to face or deal with, we close the eyes as a way to say like, nope, don't want to deal with that, don't want to think about that. When it comes to the rubbing of the knee, that is called a pacifying gesture or an adapter or a manipulator or a self-soothing gesture. The research has a lot of different words for it, but it's been highly researched. And any motion that has this kind of massage-like thing and is repetitive in nature or a caress type thing that's repetitive, usually falls under one of those categories. And it's a way that we reduce stress. And this has been seen in humans all over the world, regardless of demographic. The important thing to remember about these gestures is that they happen really quickly, immediately after she says the sentence that would have irritated her back then, still now, and they're quickly gone as well. None of them are highlighted. None of them are dramatized or made obvious. They just kind of happen and then they go away. Put a pin in that. That's really important. Now we're gonna move on and look at how Megan's communication style, which is very much rooted in her experience on stage and on camera, affects her messaging and how some of these behaviors can help us understand when there's something hiding behind 
what she's saying overtly. But before we do, do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavioral analysis and practical psychology content. <laughs> Megan, uh, I want to come back to you because social media has really become the go-to place for girls and women to be scrutinized, objectified, bullied, right? And unfortunately, I know that this is something that you are all too familiar with. So how have you been able to manage the seemingly endless toxicity uh, that comes at you? Um, yes, social media is a environment that I think has a lot of that, you know, I, it's really interesting as I can reflect on it. I keep my distance from it right now just for my own um, well-being, but the bulk of the bullying and abuse that I was experiencing in social media and online was when I was pregnant with Archie and with Lily and with a newborn with each of them. Um, and you just think about that and you like, to really wrap your head around why people would be so hateful. It's not catty, it's cruel. Why you would do that, and certainly when you're pregnant or you have a newborn, we all, as moms, you know it's such a tender and sacred time. And I think, you know, you could either succumb to it or nearly succumb to how painful that is. And maybe in some regards, because I was pregnant, that mammalian instinct just kicked in. Do everything you can to protect your child and as a result, protect yourself too. But, you know, I think as we look at what's happening in social media, there is so much work to be done in terms of keeping people safe. And that starts as we see what's happening with children um, and their exposure to things, but also just creating these habits that what I find the most disturbing, frankly, especially as a supporter of women, is how much of the hate is women completely spewing that to other women. All right, I want to start this one off by saying that the question that was asked might have a small false equivalence in it. So the question is about women and girls online being scrutinized, objectified, and bullied. And that's a fact that's happening out there. It's horrible and that should stop. Fact. And then the question is directed to Megan as someone who's all too familiar with this phenomenon. Now, I won't deny the fact that there are people out there on social media who senselessly bully women or people of color, and I'm sure she gets comments like that. I'm sure she gets a bunch of people who senselessly bully, objectify, and scrutinize. And if that's the case, there should absolutely be an end to that. That should not be tolerated. However, in my experience, as someone who's posted a couple of videos about Megan, and I've seen firsthand the negativity that she gets, for the most part, in my experience, a lot of these negative criticisms are a response to things that she's chosen to talk about and to say in documentaries or in interviews or on TV shows. Now, you might think that the criticism is warranted, you might think the criticism is unwarranted, but ultimately it doesn't matter. What I'm trying to say is, I don't think that the bulk of the criticism that she gets is exactly comparable to a girl who puts pictures of herself on social media and gets criticized for the way she looks or the way she dresses. So I think there's a difference there. And although she might have some of that, I don't think she's the epitome of someone who gets criticized, bullied, and scrutinized baselessly online. Let me know what you think about that in the comments. Now look at her response. She starts with a yes and an eyebrow flash towards Aaron, the interviewer. And there's a ton of research on eyebrow flash when we speak. And usually it's either due to emphasis, social connection, or surprise. But it all comes from the same root. We use our eyebrows to give importance to something. So here she's going, yes, acknowledging the importance of this. And now look at what happens next. So she starts by echoing elements of the question. Yes, social media is an environment where there's a lot of that. And this is something we often do where we repeat or we formulate the question to give us a second to come up with an answer. Where am I going with this? But look what happens next. We see that flutter of processing. She stops talking, dead in her tracks, as she's fluttering to try to think about what she's gonna say next. Then we hear, you know, pause. It's really interesting. And then she starts to talk. And then she finally gets to an answer where she says that right now she keeps a distance from it for her own well-being. And I think there's a lot going on here. I think this obvious sign of what we call the cognitive load, I think there's an increase there, which is why we're seeing this stalling, this hesitation, this 
a bit of a repeating the question, fluttering. She's struggling here to see where she's going to go with this. I think there's a lot of reasons for that. The first one goes back to what we were talking about earlier. She knows that this is unedited. She knows that a lot of the critics out there are going to be ripping this apart. So she really has to measure her words carefully here because this topic is specifically about them. So she's really trying to figure out, okay, how can I go about this and navigate this the right way? Another reason I believe that there's some processing going on here is because of what I said a moment ago. I think she knows very well that a lot of the criticism towards her isn't necessarily baseless bullying. I'm sure there's some of that, but a lot of it is a criticism of the things that she said, and she knows that. So she might be trying to figure out how to best formulate this to talk about something, which is online bullying that happens to a lot of people out there, but not necessarily in the same way that it happens to her. But I think there's a third reason, that there's this stalling and reflecting, and she says that she's staying away from social media right now for her own well-being. And that's really interesting. Why now? You would think that the worst you had it would have been after the Oprah interview, after the Netflix documentary. Why is now when you're staying away from social media suddenly? In recent news, fans of Meghan Markle and Prince Harry, otherwise known as the Sussex Squad, have been criticized quite a bit because lately they've been a little bit on the attack towards Princess Catherine. Because there's been a lot of stuff in the news about her lately, a little bit about her health, but also about a picture that she posted that was photoshopped. So Megan is very aware that despite having a lot of critics, she also has a lot of really passionate supporters who also dish out criticism on her behalf. She's very well aware of that. And lately they've been quite active, particularly towards another woman, Princess Catherine. So it's really difficult for her to sit on a panel talking about women being criticized out there without addressing her own fans and saying, you know, even some of my own fans are doing this and that needs to stop as well. It would be much easier to say that I've been off social media lately, so I'm not really sure what's going on out there. That seems quite convenient given that lately Princess Catherine has been taking a lot of heat from her fan base. Then she talks about how the bulk of the bullying that she received was when she was pregnant with Archie and Lily and she talks about how you know she doesn't understand why anybody would do that especially at a time like that which is sacred and she knows that this is going to play particularly well with this audience who are here to talk about women equality but it's almost like there's a focus on the wrong thing because yeah it did spike during her pregnancy but it also happens to align with the fact that she was pregnant with Lily when she did that Oprah interview and Archie was very recently born. So that's the reason there was a lot of criticism around that period of time. If someone's watching this panel and doesn't really know Meghan Markle and her story and the timing of things, it really sounds here like she's saying that she was bullied more during that time and so in the mind it might create an equivalence that isn't exactly right. She was bullied because she was pregnant? Why would it have a spike then? It's being left out that at that time a very controversial interview came out. Now please understand I'm not defending bullying at all. I'm just saying that a big part of the reason that it spiked in that time of her life is because that interview came out and a lot of people had things to say about the content of that interview. There are a few lines she's saying in this discussion that are directed immediately to her critics. And one of them is, it's not catty, it's cruel. That's what she said. And I recognize these little lines. This is her trying to get ahead of certain things and thinking of those people who say, oh, it's catty, you know, we're just, they're just being catty. And she's going, no, no, it's not catty, it's cruel. And a lot of people who get criticized online tend to do things like this. They kind of preemptively shut down arguments because they've seen them or read them a lot of times before, so just kind of get that out there publicly. So Megan seems to have this communication style of having these scripts that she's comfortable with, that she's delivered before, and every now and then we see her bridge between those scripts and she goes to something else that she said before and she's just comfortable delivering it. And we see her confidence go up and down with those bridges as she makes it to the next script. And I think there's one here where she kind of engaged the wrong script and then had to get out of it. Because the question was about her being bullied, right? And in talking about her being bullied, she segued into her pregnancy with Archie and Lily and then she said something strange. She said that her mammalian instinct kicked in. So her protective instinct of her children. And that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because we were talking about her being bullied, not her children being bullied. I think what's going on is she's talked about previously in interviews 
some concerning things that people said about her unborn son when she was pregnant with Archie. And I think she has a script for that, like this protectiveness that she felt towards him. And I think here, because she was talking about the pregnancy, she kind of went to that script, not realizing that just before that, she wasn't talking about the children. She was talking about herself being bullied. That's what this question was about. So when she goes, you know, maybe my mammalian instinct kicked in there. I think she goes for a sec, oh no, wait, that's not what we're talking about. And I think as she realizes that while she's talking about protecting her child, she kind of tacks on and as a result, protect yourself too, to get back on subject. But in that moment, we see a drop in confidence, the tone drops, we see that flutter, we see this bit of a no gesture, which is extremely ambiguous. I know a lot of people out there think that the moment someone does this, they're lying or they're being deceptive. That's absolutely a myth. But it does suggest some sort of a disagreement, a disbelief, some sort of inner conflict. So at that point, we see a grooming gesture where the hand comes up and moves some of the hair out of the way. And this is not uncommon for people on stage in front of a camera. It's happening a lot on that stage. Grooming gestures are just things that we do to fix our appearance. And all it suggests is that our focus is being internalized now. We're thinking about how we're coming off. So it's not always a big deal because very often on stage we're self-aware, but it's interesting that here after this flutter, after this drop in tone, after this quick eye block, we're seeing this grooming gesture as she tries to get off the subject. And maybe in some regards, because I was pregnant, that mammalian instinct just kicked in, do everything you can to protect your child, and as a result, protect yourself too. But, you know, I think as we look at what's happening in social media... And listen to what she says next. There is so much work to be done in terms of keeping people safe. And that starts as we see what's happening with children um, and their exposure to things, but also just creating these habits that what I find the most disturbing, frankly, especially as a supporter of women. You know, I think as we look at what's happening on social media, and then pause, there is so much work to be done in terms of keeping people safe. It's a very ambiguous statement followed by, and that starts as we see what's happening with children um, and their exposure to things, but also just creating the habits. What I find most disturbing, frankly, especially as a supporter of women, so that's a lot of sentences to not really say anything too concrete. And it almost has this feeling where she's just trying to grasp at straws until she could figure out, okay, here's a thread I can follow. And at no point in all this is she answering the question, which was, how do you manage the toxicity? How do you deal with it? So it almost seems like she has these scripts that relate to being bullied on social media and a few got jumbled in together here and then she kind of lost her way and then she got a little bit back on track and now we're gonna continue down that path of women being bullied online. Now before we look at the rest of the answer, I wanna to touch on something that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. My goal is never to attack or to defend anyone. I know that some people will look at my analysis and go, oh, you're attacking her. Or people look at my analysis and go, why are you defending her like that? And what's crazy is it's often the same analysis. I've done videos about Meghan Markle before where on the same video, a bunch of people thought that I obviously despise her and a bunch of people thought that I'm obviously a huge fan. It's neither. But I am aware of the fact that sometimes analysis feels a little critical because we're looking at the behaviors and trying to see what's hiding behind the verbal communication. And to some people that feels like an attack because how dare anyone say anything bad or even critical about someone like this. And on the other hand, some people think that I'm being way too nice because I'm not being critical or mean enough in my analysis. But I don't think that speaks to my bias. I think it speaks to the bias of those people. So I'll remind you of something that we've been talking about on the channel a lot lately. If you're one of those people who despises Meghan Markle, when you're looking at some of these answers, imagine it's someone else, someone that you like, someone that you trust, and see if they were to answer a question exactly that way, would it irritate you as much? Or are you coming in with, I despise this person, so all their behaviors only work towards that conclusion. Similarly, if you're a big fan, with these answers, try to replace her in your mind with someone that you don't like or you don't trust. And with some answers, you might look at it and go, oh yeah, if that was someone else, I think I might have a little bit of questions about what's going on over there. And ultimately, I think this can help people realize that nobody is always all good and nobody is always all bad. And I promise you, people will take your opinion a lot more seriously if there is a bit of balance to it, rather than coming at it from 
everything she does is awful or everything she does is the best. Most things in life are not entirely black or white. There are a lot of women that are at the highest level, executive level, who are great champions of women, who are great philanthropists, and they are working in these spaces and yet they're allowing this kind of behavior to run rampant. And at a certain point, they have got to put the do's behind the say's and really make some changes on a systemic level. And then, you know, on the flip side of that, we have a responsibility in all of that. And I think that is the piece that is so lost right now in what's happening in the digital space and in certain sectors of the media. We have forgotten about our humanity. And that has got to change because I understand there's a bottom line and I understand that a lot of money is being made there. But even if it's making dollars, it doesn't make sense. <clears throat> yeah. Can I can I just add one one thing yes. to that? Because what you said is, is also very important. It's so it's so it's impossible. Social media was not around when all the vitriol was being hurled at me and my mother and everything, and and it was unbelievable. Now I never read any of it. Um, had there been social media, I, mine have just disintegrated me. I don't I don't know. Um, but when you know, this, the whole idea of social media in your household with your young, in my case, women. My daughters were the ones to tell me, Mom, don't read the comments. And I found that really interesting. I would like to inject my personal opinion on this. Forgive me for a moment. As someone who has worked in the public eye for the last 20 years, I do believe that there is a awful bullying problem and spreading of such negativity online, on social media. It's absolutely horrifying how I'll often go look at videos on social media of young artists, whether it's in my field, which is magic, mentalism, or musicians, and you see all these people just being discouraging and mean and commenting on things that have nothing to do with anything, on the aesthetic and advice that nobody asked for, like, oh, you, should, you should perform it like this, or oh, change the way you do that, or change the way you look, from accounts that have like 12 followers criticizing an account that has tens, hundreds of thousands, sometimes even millions. And I'm often left wondering like, what, what are you doing? Is this the only thing you have to say about this content of someone who's sharing their passion and doing really well with it and you're coming in with criticism and advice in a field that you don't even understand? But my mind does keep going back to the fact that there is a difference between someone who puts pictures of themselves or a video of themselves on social media and gets heavily criticized and someone who goes out and does interviews and documentaries where they say controversial things and get criticized. And I apply that thinking to myself as well. When people criticize the way I look or what I wear or what's in my background, I'm like, this is really stupid. Like, what, what, is this really all you have to talk about? And that can be seen as bullying or critical if I cared. But on the other hand, if people criticize an idea that I put out there, if I announce something, if I say something controversial and people come back and go, you really shouldn't have said that, I don't see why you said that, I don't think that necessarily falls under the bullying bracket. And in that segment, Meghan Markle is doing something really interesting. She's saying that this isn't only coming from trolls online. It's coming from highest level, executive level, great champions of women. So she's talking about leaders that are part of the problem. And I think again, this is her subtly aiming at her critics and saying that, you know, it's not just these trolls that are senselessly bullying me, this is also coming from executives, accomplished, intelligent people. I think she knows that that's a bigger problem for her because everyday trolls just making senseless noise don't tend to carry too much weight. It's easy to say, okay, it's some, some troll. But when it's coming from executives, women who have power, women who have influence, who are criticizing some of what she's doing, that's a bigger problem. So it almost seems like she's trying to rally people here and saying that it's not just the trolls that are unacceptable, but even at an executive level, criticism between women shouldn't be accepted. I also thought it was interesting how Brooke Shields interjected, jumped into the question, and if we just summarize what she said into one sentence, she basically said, yeah, but don't read it. Because here we have Meghan Markle, who took a lot of time here talking about social media and bullying and how unacceptable it is, how cruel it is, and how much of a problem it is. And Brooke Shields is, is really insisting to jump in to say, yeah, but when I was young, I didn't read it. And now that social media is a thing, my daughters told me don't read it. And she's basically going, yeah, it might be really mean, it might be out there, it might be really cruel, 
but it can't really do anything if you just don't read it. If you have that confidence in knowing it's not true, then it's just noise. Brooke Shields was really interesting to watch throughout this panel. She's obviously someone who's been a celebrity from a very young age, so she's kind of always lived in the spotlight, and we see her capacity as an entertainer on stage. She's often quite funny and uh, often self-deprecating, which connects well with the audience. And here we're almost seeing the confidence of a woman who basically grew up in Hollywood and understands the game. In going that, listen, you're never gonna be able to do anything about the critics. We could sit here and talk about this all day. It's still gonna be there. All you could do is be sure of yourself and just ignore it. Megan, last year the U.S. Surgeon General even weighed in on this, issuing a warning that social media use is a main contributor to depression and anxiety in teenagers. Uh, the Archwell Foundation seems to be doing so much work at the forefront of the online world, so you are somebody that is also, you know, walking the walk here, especially for young people. Can you talk about what you've learned and where you think we need to go as a society to better support parents, especially mothers? I mean, I, I really think it's sort of, it can piggyback on what Brooke was saying as well, but, you know, with our 12 Foundation, we work with Social Media Victims Law Center, um, which is very important and heartaching work, heartbreaking work. It's parents whose children have taken their lives because of what was happening to them in the online space and um, the level of online harms that are there when you have these beautiful, vibrant children that are either being so aggressively bullied online or, frankly, these young girls who are going online and you're just, they're drowning in this world of comparison that suddenly their sense of self has become so small that they don't see a value in being alive. So we've... So in all my analysis videos, one of the things that I received the most credit for that a lot of people shared, that there was a lot of articles written about, and in the comments, a lot of people said, oh my God, that's what it is, thank you. I couldn't place it for the longest time, is something about Meghan Markle and the way she communicates. And something that I'm very familiar with, given my work as a stage performer, particularly in the field of magic and mentalism. And that thing is the extent of facial expressions and illustrators used in communication. So illustrators are the gestures we make to accentuate what we're saying. It could even be the facial expressions that allow us to communicate these things. So hands and the face. And in magic, often you have magicians who have their specialties. Like you have the close-up guys, the illusionists, my specialty is mentalism, and you have performers who just stick to those specific specialties. But you have a few who do a little bit of everything. They might do a family show in the morning and then they'll do a stage show at night for adults. And sometimes with those people, you see them take the mannerisms from the kids show in the morning and bring it to a stage for adults and it doesn't work. Because all of a sudden you have someone doing magic to an audience of adults that are going, and if I take your card and I put it inside the deck and shuffle the cards, and it just doesn't connect. Because a lot of adults, not saying all adults, but a lot of adults don't like to be spoken to the way you would talk to a child, with exaggerated gestures and the voice going up and down, with all these kind of inflections in the voice and emphasis here and then slow down there. So a lot of people find that a little childish, not everyone. Now because of her experience as an actress or just because of the way she talks in front of the camera, Megan has a very exaggerated way of talking with her gestures, with her tonality, with her facial expressions and there are times where she really turns it on and other times where it's a little bit more under control. And I would say that during this event it fluctuated, there were ups and downs, but right here it's a weird place to be this expressive. Right, because you're talking about people with self-confidence issues, depression, people taking their lives, and the work they're doing is great. I would never take that away from anyone, but it's not the place for these grand gestures and the voice going up and down. Now, once again, to some people, it doesn't matter. They don't even register it. And some people speak this way themselves, so it's totally normal. But for certain people who prefer the mannerisms, the illustrators to match the mood, this can get irritating. And there are a lot of people who will get irritated by it not knowing why until it's pointed out. So here she's talking about the self-esteem of young girls online and she talks about how they're drowning 
in this sense of comparison and they feel so small. So her voice is really having those big ups and downs and we have these gestures and throughout that whole thing she has this smile because she's trying to connect with the audience but to some people this isn't necessarily the place for this smile to talk about how depressed these girls are. It's just so incongruent. It was even hard for me to express a serious sense of depression with that smile on my face. The other thing is when our illustrators and facial expressions fall out of sync with the emotions that we're expressing, people subconsciously register this and it feels inauthentic. We talk about this a lot on the channel to where when people are conveying something, the emotions and the gestures match what's being said in real time. Here there's a delay. So she starts by talking about these beautiful, vibrant children and she's smiling. But here's the thing. She knows where the story is going to go. She knows that she's about to talk about how they're depressed, how they take their own lives. So this smile is trying to convey that one moment, that one adjective, the vibrant children. And if I was telling you a story from a fairy tale, that might be a place for a smile, but then, uh oh, the witch arrived. So now we change that tonality. But if someone's telling you something sad, a real sad thing, they don't smile at the vibrant children because we know where the story is going. But the biggest incongruency here is not the smiling when she's saying beautiful, vibrant children because worse comes to worse. Like, okay, she's on stage, beautiful and vibrant children. And she has that method of communicating anyways. It's how long that smile stays on the face because we go from beautiful and vibrant children who are aggressively bullied online and we're still seeing a smile. And from that we go to, or frankly, these young girls who are going online, still smiling. Beautiful, vibrant children that are either being so aggressively bullied online, or frankly, these young girls who are going online and you're just... And only when she gets to the specific topic of suicide, right at the end, does that smile go away. And I'll tell you exactly what that is. In my experience, that's someone who said, okay, illustrate this, and then forgets to turn it off. Right? Because when the illustrator isn't coming as a result of the emotion where she's thinking about these vibrant children and then as that thought of the vibrant children turns into something darker, that smile would fade with it. This is someone who's going, okay, smile to connect with your audience. So look, I think after everything, that is just a really great segment to demonstrate why some people are inherently irritated by Meghan Markle and some people just don't care because this style of communication bothers a lot of people but not all people. Ultimately, I think what we have here is just more Meghan Markle. Someone who, even when she's trying to communicate and talk about serious topics, we have this actress background that she can't get rid of. So we're seeing these scripts that she's going to, we're seeing these ways of communicating, we're seeing moments where she's fluttering and hesitating and trying to get to that next point, losing her point in places and almost conveniently at certain points ignoring that although she's a recipient of bullying, there's also a big fan base who look up to her, who support her and they're also responsible for some of the bullying. And I do wish at some point personally in this whole event, she would have said, by the way, I'm aware of the fact that this even comes from my fan base sometimes and I'm not a fan of that. Instead, it seems like things were being worded a little bit to make it seem like she was being very bullied when she was pregnant without mentioning what else was going on around that time. She's saying that, you know, she hasn't been online recently, which seems kind of coincidental given that her fan base has been quite active lately criticizing Princess Catherine. So it does seem like things are being shifted and presented in ways that represent what's most in her favor. And I'll keep saying this again and again until I'm blue in the face, the way that's perceived depends on the way we perceive the messenger. So a lot of people who are just looking for fault will look at this and go, oh, there she goes again talking all about herself. There's a panel up there talking about an important topic and all she's doing up there is settling her own scores. And then you have other people who go, no, it's great. She's relating it to her own experience, talking about herself and it's important for her to bring her own experience into this and this is the way she experienced it. So it's totally fine. And whatever your opinion of this is, you're completely entitled to it. I just encourage people to question their biases and see, okay, what else could be going on here and have conversations with an open mind. Even here in the comments, let's keep it respectful because I'm sure there's going to be some disagreements, but I always like to think that no matter what my opinion is, there are intelligent people who completely disagree with me. So let's keep an open mind. Let me know what you thought in the comments about all this and I will see you on the next one.